Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. The Bible says in Jonah 1:17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The first chapter of Jonah ends with one of the most bizarre events in biblical history. A man is swallowed by a great fish. Because this part of the story is so unusual, attacks have been made against the account's accuracy. In fact, I was surprised in my visit with the president of the mosque in Nashville, Yasser Arafat, no relation to the PLO leader, when his first challenge to the inspiration of the New Testament was Jesus' reference to Jonah. No doubt, the Lord anticipated these assaults and saw fit to refer to the story of Jonah as genuine history. Jesus not only acknowledges the occurrence, but used it as a symbol of his own death, burial, and resurrection in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 41. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up, in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The King James Version renders the phrase whale's belly instead of the belly of the great fish. But the literal translation, according to Robertson's word pictures, is sea monster or huge fish. This harmonizes with the Old Testament word as well. The Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary reads, The fish, through a mistranslation of Matthew 12, 40, was formerly supposed to be a whale. There, as here, the original means a great fish. The most common objection to the genuineness of this story is the unlikelihood of a sea monster or huge fish swallowing a man. Equally amazing is Jonah's ability to breathe and to somehow survive while he's surrounded by the digestive juices of a massive fish. McGarvey says in the fourfold gospel, many think that it was the white shark, which is still plentiful in the Mediterranean and which sometimes measures 60 feet in length and is large enough to swallow a man whole. The Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary adds, Bocart thinks... The dogfish, the stomach of which is so large that the body of a man in armor was once found in it. The cavity in the whale's throat is large enough, according to Captain Scoresby, to hold a ship's jolly boat full of men. A miracle in any view is needed, and we have no date to speculate, no data rather, to speculate further. A sign or miracle it is expressly called by our Lord in Matthew 12, 39. The greatest miracle of all, perhaps, is that a creature this size would happen to be right there when Jonah was thrown overboard and could be induced to swallow someone the size of a human being. Isn't it also remarkable that God would use the great fish as an instrument to save Jonah from drowning? The error often made when people challenge the facts of this case is the failure to recognize that Jesus himself referred to Jonah and the great fish as a sign or miracle and identified Jonah's three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish with his own death, burial, and resurrection. Both indicate the miraculous hand of God and are not limited to natural events. More about Jonah and the great fish. But first, enjoy our song. For many years I was a slave to Satan. I loved him and was I to do his will. But since that day I gave my heart to Jesus. My life has found a purpose to fulfill.
With the opening of chapter 2, Jonah realizes what a bind he's in. Like the healing sailors in chapter 1, Jonah gets religion now that he finds himself in an emergency. Many people today practice crisis Christianity. When times are good, they are indifferent toward the kingdom of God, the church, and spiritual matters. But when some serious trouble develops, they fall on their knees and plead for mercy. In an August 29, 2011 article titled, Barna Study Explores Faith in New York Since 9-11, pollster George Barna writes, in the immediate aftermath of the September 11 attacks, millions of Americans flocked to churches and houses of worship. But for most, the shift in spiritual behavior was short-lived. According to tracking research by the Barna Group, within a few months, the spiritual lives of the nation's population were back to pre-attack levels. Temporary discipleship does not demonstrate genuine love for God. Fickle followers want God to be there for them at all times, but opt not to serve God at all times. Jesus says in Revelation 2, verse 10, Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't be fickle. Be faithful. You can't blame Jonah, though. What can you do when you find yourself devoured by a giant sea creature? Maybe that's what some of us need. Talk about claustrophobia. If he didn't have it before, he certainly did now. Jonah is crammed into the stomach of this sea creature. I love to eat fish, but ooh, there was a level of fishiness inside the belly of this creature that no man could appreciate. No food or water, at least that could be kept down. Jonah also experienced a darkness like nothing he'd known before. The cross teaches us, though, that Jonah's sinful disobedience merited even worse than he was experiencing. The great fish deserves pity. If he had his druthers, no doubt he would have spit Jonah out immediately. Jonah did appear to get his mind right in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, and then verse 9 and 10. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Verse 9, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The once reluctant prophet as Linwood Smith used to put it, hit the beach a running. As much as we hate trials and crises, they often bring the best out of us. In 1505, at age 21, Martin Luther had completed his master's degree and was planning to com complete law school when he faced his own moment of crisis. He was caught in the midst of a thunderstorm, and a lightning bolt nearly struck him. He prayed that he would become a monk if God would spare him. God did, so he left law school and changed the course of history. 20-year-old Alexander Campbell, his mother and siblings, were caught in a storm on the ship Hibernia, bound for America from Ireland in 1808. That day, two other vessels were shipwrecked with no survivors, one only a mile away. But all aboard the Hibernia survived. Reflecting on the bigger issues of life and plans for the future after the shipwreck, Alexander Campbell decided to devote his life to preaching. Perhaps the crisis that you're going through right now can lead you to greater service and devotion to God. It can help stimulate a change in the right direction for you. Jonah has a new lease on life, and so God starts over. We can all thank God for second chances. Jonah chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh 
was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. God made the mission clear. Preach the message I give you. Jonah was not free to develop his own scheme, his own message. The same is true today. The Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, charged the evangelists in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine or teaching. 1 Peter 4, verse 11 reads, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God or as the word of God. Many preachers are unwilling to preach it straight, stay within these parameters. They soft soap every sermon rather than telling people what they need to hear. One theology professor calls this kind of preaching a cotton candy gospel and says that this kind of preacher uses the Bible like a fortune cookie. Jonah's sermon was brief and blunt. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Who could have predicted the response? First of all, the preacher actually wants them destroyed. He doesn't care about them. They don't have the Jews' background with the law and the prophets. There was nothing about the love and mercy of God for the Assyrians, those in Nineveh. There was no Jesus, no cross, no forgiveness. And yet, the whole city of Nineveh, about a million people, we estimate, brought forth fruit, meat for repentance. Listen to Jonah 3, beginning with verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? They not only believed the message, they acted on it. Nobody. Not even the animals ate or drank for three days. Even the king demonstrated great humility, covering himself in sackcloth instead of his royal robes and sitting in ashes instead of on his throne. No wonder Jesus used this story to censure his Jewish audience for their stubborn unbelief in Matthew 12, 41. You remember what it says? The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater, Jesus, the Son of God, than Jonah is here. Brutal indictment, but they had it coming. What about you? Look at the advantage you have had over Nineveh. You have the entire Bible. You can open it and read it yourself. You have the amazing proofs of its authenticity found within it. You know the story of Jesus. You know about the love, the mercy, and forgiveness that God is anxious to extend through the sacrifice of His precious Son. But you are too proud to submit to His will. If you stay on this path, this charge Jesus gives will include you. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. We see God's response to Nineveh's repentance in Jonah 3, verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. It's important to note that while the nature of God does not change, Malachi 3, verse 6, God does change his mind. He changed his mind about destroying Nineveh because they changed their heart. Skeptics attack this book in various ways. But one proof this book is authentic is how it per portrays Jonah, the greatest prophet in Israel at the time and the representative of the Jewish nation, and how this book depicts 
the notorious Ninevites. What Jew would prop up a nation that was one of Israel's most bitter enemies, and as the text talks about their wickedness? What Jew would expose a heroic Jewish prophet this way? Talk about miracles. An even more amazing fact, the skeptic would have to explain, even if a rogue Jew had written a story bashing their prophet and praising their enemies, why would the Jews accept it as the Word of God and part of genuine history? Come on. Just as it is so easy to focus on the mercy of God to the prodigal son that you overlook his mercy on the older brother in Luke 15, there is also a tendency to overlook God's mercy on Jonah while fixating on God's forgiveness to Nineveh. Consider how much foolishness God endures with Jonah and reflect on how much God has taken from you without striking you dead, being used by God as his instrument to save the million citizens of Nineveh should have been one of the greatest thrills of this prophet's life. But instead, we find that Jonah is furious. We're in Jonah now, chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord. This, by the way, is no model prayer. And said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take away my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. A pompous private rebukes the general and tries to force God to make a choice. Jonah says, in other words, which will it be? Choose between them or me. If you're not going to take them out, then take me out because my life is not worth living if you spare them. God does not respond to threats, and he does not let us call the shots. God is so patient, though. He challenges Jonah to demonstrate a little self-awareness. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? The prophet appears to go off in a huff, hoping that God somehow will change his mind and honor his favorite prophet's wishes. Jonah 4, verses 5 and 6. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant or a gourd the King James Version says, and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plan. Let's take all this in. Jonah hates the Ninevites, even when they repent as a nation. Jonah doesn't care about them because they are not Jews. He sure does care a lot about this plant or gourd, though, we tend to be like that, don't we? We value highly our gourds. We treasure our three-bedroom, two-bath gourds, our four-door, eight-cylinder gourds, our Nitro Z9 Mercury 250 Optimax Pro XS gourds, our bolt-action gourds, our 42-inch flat-screen gourds, etc. But the lost soul down the street or across the border it's not our concern. Who cares? God is teaching Jonah a lesson. Jonah chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Here we go again with the death wish. Jonah is throwing another fit. But are we any different? Are we more concerned about our own comfort than the souls of men? 
Aren't you glad God doesn't expose all of our childish, selfish, private thoughts and words? So many times we're not even concerned about our own souls. Jonah is more like us than we'd like to admit. The story concludes with God confronting Jonah again with his immaturity, his selfishness. In Jonah chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? The story ends with a question. It's easy to love our own family and those most like us, but remember that all of mankind are God's children. Remember that Jesus didn't just die for the Jews, thankfully, but neither did Jesus just die for whites or just for blacks or just for Latinos or just for Asians. We are all of one blood, Acts 17, verse 26. Jesus died to save any and as many would obey him. Doesn't matter the color, doesn't matter their background, doesn't matter what language they speak. He wanted them to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the words of the Holy Spirit in 1 John 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? If you have children, you get what God is saying, don't you? As fathers, we may not like it, if someone mistreats us, but that's nothing compared to how we feel if you mistreat our children. Well, folks, that's how God feels too. We're all, all mankind are the children of God. Well, we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message, Who Cares, right after our song. Sunday. Isn't it interesting that Jesus used this story to point to his own death, burial, and resurrection? Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's not the only time that his resurrection was pictured, pictured by Jonah. But we also find in Romans chapter 6, verse 2 through 4, that it was pictured it is pictured when we are baptized. 
Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We contact the death of Christ, the blood of Christ, when we're baptized. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We contact the death, brown resurrection. We reenact that death, brown resurrection when we're baptized. You can't really walk in newness of life. You can't have your sins forgiven until this time. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll watch the program every Lord's Day and meet us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. You can call to receive a free DVD of number 848, Who Cares? We also offer a free booklet on the Lord's Supper for you, and you can also go to LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos of the program. We close by saying the same words that the Apostle Paul spoke in Romans 16, verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you.